Welcome to the American Landscape. Don't forget to like and subscribe and hit that bell to be reminded of all our future travel videos. On today's journey in the American landscape, we're heading back to California and California's Central Valley. Our first stop will be the International Agri Center in Tulare, and then we'll move up into Kingsburg, where we're going to see an historic jail and a Swedish coffee pot water tower. And then the final stop will be in Fresno, where we're going to see the Kearney Mansion. So sit back and relax and enjoy the show. Hi, I'm Greg Knight, and welcome to the American Landscape. Our first stop is going to be the International Agri Center. It's just 62 miles from Bakersfield, 143 miles from Modesto, and 50 miles from downtown Fresno. So let's go ahead and go inside and we'll see Jennifer Fox, the Agri Center's marketing manager. Hey. Jennifer. Yes. I'm Greg. Nice to meet you. To welcome. You too. Well, thank you. Yeah. So this is the. Agri Center? This is the International Agri, Agri Center. Center. And what makes it international? So the biggest thing is World Ag Expo, and it is the largest ag trade show in the world. We welcomed people from, from more than 50 countries this year oh. to the show. Now what shows up in an Agri Show? Is it a bunch of tractors and trailers? or what Absolutely, yeah. plus more, yeah. Oh. So this year, and like most recent years, lots of artificial intelligence, lots of, we had uh, facial recognition for cows come from Ireland. Canthus came. Really? And yes, brought some new technology. <laughs> uh, but it's also everything from latches and fertilizer to crop advisors and anything dairy related. Uh, lots of big equipment, lots of small, palm of your hand, high tech technology. Oh, interesting. All right, welcome to the museum. Wow, this is kind of not what I expected. This is <laughs> right. huge. Right, it does. You there's walk an in. airplane. There is an airplane. Yeah, big tractor or two or three or four yes wow. yes we have a little bit of everything from crop dusting to how tractors used to work whether it's steam or gas or diesel to a little bit more current so people can get an idea and hop up in a cab well let's take a walk through and we'll okay. walk around a little bit we have everything from tractors um, you can see one owners and families that are very proud of the history of not only the tractors they've used, but it also plays into the history of their farms. Okay. And again, family farms are largely um, the type of farming all over this country. Yeah, this looks kind of familiar. My one side of my family is a farming family from Missouri. Sure. And I never saw. I'm first generation Californian, but when we went out there, they had kind of this like sure. I want to say from the Pixar movies when they were tipping yeah. <laughs> tipping tractors uh, look something like this so absolutely. this seems like to be a staple of the American farm absolutely and you know it's interesting these are red tractors these are international harvesters oh so it's not McCormick farm it is well it's a McCormick farm all but you see the um IH on there yes so there's a long history of consolidation and okay. purchasing and coming together. And so International Harvester today is an amalgamation of a lot of different oh. companies that they have purchased. So we have some farm trucks that you can see, of course, the Sunkist yes, version yeah. where you can buy the oranges right off the back in this case. But of course, farm trucks have a long history. Um, you absolutely, once you've gotten everything uh, produced on the farm, you need to get it into town. You might need to do some work on the farm and you're gonna mm -hmm. have to throw some tools in the back. And we also have some hot rods in here, or at least one. <laughs> You'll notice we do have a bright red Porsche uh, here on the on the floor. Oh, sure. I see how maybe the average person lived Absolutely. on the farm. And these like makeup looks like the kitchen back yes. here. Yes, and that's important for kids to know. And we can head over to the kitchen. Okay, um, but. We absolutely like to share with them, and Krista does a fantastic job of demonstrating how farm families used to live and all the things that you had to do to make a home function mm -hmm. and to just having breakfast every morning, the washing, the just getting water into the house. Again, no running water. Yes. So to demonstrate to some of um, you know students that come through that you had to go to the river, you're probably mm. going to have to boil it. Are you drinking it? Are you washing with it? And to just get the household running every day, that really, truly was a full-time oh, job, if not a few full-time jobs. We've seen some, I think what we see, the evolving of the tractor here. Absolutely, Getting so bigger. you can see, we have a big steam tractor, uh, the Universal there, the uh, Rumley, and it goes from steam, just like uh, a train, and then we're gonna go to gas. And so you have everything from the, that large steam tractor, all the way to now we have some Fords, they're the smaller. This is, you know, that typical workhorse tractor mm -hmm. that you're gonna see 
Um, that and a John Deere are very similar. So an early mm -hmm. Caterpillar, this is a Holt. Holt and uh, Caterpillar uh, became, basically became one, but you know, track systems. And you can see there's one seat. Yeah. One person's gonna drive that beast. Is it fair to say that California and maybe more directly the Central Valley of California is the breadbasket of the world? Absolutely. We and, are and how do we back that up? <laughs> sure. So <laughs> California in general, though, about 350 to 450 different commodities are grown in California, all the way from Northern California with rice uh, to the Central Valley with nuts and fruits. Um, there's still cotton grown here. But the amount of product that comes out of the Central Valley is amazing. The, the top three ag counties in this country are right here in the Central Valley. And in order, that's Fresno County, Kern County, and Tulare County. And they all border are. each other. Yes, right? we do. And Kings County is always in the mix on that one as well, and Madera County. So you really have a five county area that is feeding the world. So this is really the hands on area now. It's Absolutely. Like, so I saw some, some kids over there like milking a cow, yes. a little, little fake cow. And I see a little tractor driving yes, thing you can here. Go. It's actually a theater. You can go on the track tour, sit in the seat and you answer questions, you have buttons at each one so everybody can see. Well, that's really cool. Yeah. I can see why the kids, especially the aged kids I'm seeing roaming around, love this because they Absolutely. love to touch things, right? And they we do. all do, but it really you know, brings them in. Yep. You can't really understand, you know, milk and a cow unless you kind of get in there. And right, unless see you really get like. to do it. And it's, yeah. it is well, quite please, a process. I've swapped pigs when we visited the farm. I'm like, sure. okay, I'm not built for this. <laughs> I came from the city, you know, it's like I, 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 I see what they go through. I mean, we smelled like those pigs in that slot oh, for days, you know. You do. So over here we got, I see another cow, I see some tractors. Absolutely, yeah. we have a couple cow stations that tends to be popular with the kids. It's always a they good like experience, cows, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, we also, of course, have the cow that demonstrates all the different um, products that cows can, uh, can really make. there's really not much wasted here. No. Right? It's this animal, you know, every, every time, unfortunately, sometimes food gets wasted and I, I half-heartedly joke with my kids that, you know, some animal sacrifice its, its life for you. <laughs> but it's um, true. I mean, when we take care of cows, it is, you know, farmers, it is end to end. And mm -hmm. you've got to respect this animal that is, you've taken care of and is taking care of you. Yes. And so there are lots and lots of things that can come out of uh, animals. Because if we're going to um, slaughter an animal, let's use all of them and at least yes. um, make sure that was worth it. This is a really cool and interesting place. There's a lot to take in here. There is. And, and it's almost overwhelming, but at the same time, I can see how you can pick and choose what interests you. Absolutely. And, and really dive deep into that. You can, and, yeah. that's, and that's kind of the fun thing is, this is only a portion of what we do. And this is one of the things that we do every day, but the entire building, the entire grounds, we're also in an event center. So if somebody has a meeting, a wedding, an event, I mean, This is, this is your face, your public outreach. Yes. To, to draw people in to know you were, see, I had no idea what you're about, and the cameraman says, you know, we gotta, we've driven by it a hundred times, we gotta go in here, right? <laughs> gotta go. We went in here and we're like, we gotta film here. Yes. And, and I'm sure glad you had us. Thank you, Jennifer. Yeah, well, thank you for And this is coming. really, really yeah. interesting, and I think um, once we're done here, we're gonna go take some pictures and touch some things. Perfect. And do all those interactive things. What's it cost? Sure. What's your hours of operation? Sure. We're open Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. We do have special hours, especially around events, so check uh, our website, our Facebook page. Okay. Um, but generally Monday through Friday, 8 to 5. And then it's free to come in. We want people to come and learn. If you would like to donate to support what we're doing here, we would love that. Um, we're having easily 5,000 students come through on school tours every single year. That's if amazing. not more, yeah. And then, of course, Ag Ventures Day, Ag Safety Day. Um, those are closed events, but those are the things we're doing year round to help engage more students. Ag career education is also a big piece okay, for us. Okay, so if you, you want to find out how to get into yes. business, you have help for that. Yes, so that, and we have students that we, um, we do have a program that we introduce them to those different things because there's a lot of kids that think it's just about picking fruit or working in a field. Yeah, sure. So I would say the 4-H must know of you guys. And yes, absolutely. Very involved, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's so awesome. Well, again, Jennifer, thank you for having yes, us. We really you. appreciate it. Our next stop's gonna be Kingsburg, California, and it's just 115 miles from Modesto, 89 miles from Bakersfield, and 22 miles from Fresno. Our host in Kingsburg is gonna be Dave Meyer with the Historic Society. I'm Greg. Good afternoon, Dave Meyer. Thank you for coming to Kingsburg. Oh, well, thank you for having us. I've been kind of excited. We came by one day when it was closed, and we thought we gotta see this. You know, well, we think we have a very unique community and we have some pretty neat sights to see too, this being one of them. So before we get to that, um, 
Tell us a little bit about this community, the settlers, how it got started. Kingsburg was uh, originally, like most Western towns, a really rugged uh, stop on the railroad uh, tracks. Uh, the Swedes did not get here until about 1900, if I recall correctly. Uh, and before that, it was pretty rough and tumble. Once the Swedes became a majority, they kind of brought with them a lot of their moral and, uh, codes and so on and so forth. In fact, at one point, they managed to turn the town into a dry town oh, okay. uh, where there was no alcohol, which caused no end of disturbances. You can see on our main street, if you look at the architecture, they've kind of done a faux uh, Swedish motif. It, uh, uh, it's just been something that they've maintained. We also have a uh, Swedish festival, the third Saturday in, in May of every year. It's a great, great small town festival. So at some point, this rough and tumble town decided they needed a jail, I take it. That's where we <laughs> come up with this. It says 1925. In November of 1924, the city council decided that they were gonna build a new jail. They got bids one month later and the low bidder was for $3,098, which equates today to about 45,000, I think. On the back, I saw a mural where someone is, you know, being helped to uh, escape. Was, was that a common occurrence in this jail? No. 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 <laughs> That's just it's having a, some local it's a fun. It's made-up huh? scene. Okay. Uh, we uh, felt like we wanted to put a mural on the back and, and we're, what else could you do? I mean, you know, it's just, we just started blow, throwing some ideas out. We were very fortunate that we uh, got a grant from Larry Hillbloom Foundation, which is a local foundation that uh, has been help, helped the community considerably. And uh, with that, we were able to do all of the work on the jail. It had to be painted, we had, to, we had murals. We needed to electrify it in a different way than it was. Uh, we put in surveillance cameras, and then we put in mannequins and all the furnishings with that crown. Wow, it's, it's not real big. No, it's, it's not. We didn't have too many people to put in it. But uh, you do see, uh, back there, you do see a wanted poster. That was one of, one of our notorious crimes. Um, had, we had a night watchman named Fred French, and one night he broke up a bar fight and uh, in the process got into a fight with the Mr. Cowan here, who was on the wanted poster, and um, they, he ended up calling the constable, a fellow named George Boyle. George Boyle took him into custody, and then the guy convinced him to release him. He was going to be good. He then went home and got a shotgun and went out and looked for the night watchman that had gotten into the fight with him and killed him. They never did find this this wow. man named Cowan. We know that there was, was a jail, this was a cell, got a cell the door. door. Yeah. Uh, the wall in there I had built when we got our More for display, so people you know. could go in, because yeah. if you had this here, uh, they really couldn't see it very well, so yes. we wanted them to be able to go in there. Um, and this was obviously a one-person cell. Uh, maybe it could have been used if they had a female prisoner that would have been separate from this, and this was a two-person um, cell. Okay. So I think capac maximum capacity was probably three people. Mm -hmm. Again, we have no written history, no pictures, anything. If someone's coming up and stopping here, what hours is it open? Is there any charge to see it? No, there's never been any charge. We have a hole in the stove and we're happy if somebody leaves a donation. We're very grateful for that because it's very helpful to us. But there is no cost. It's open usually it's done by volunteers. Seven to five is pretty safe bet. Okay. Beyond that, you're taking your chances. Sure. <laughs> and if they can find the coffee cup water tower or the fire department, they're going to find this because it's right behind the fire department in the shadow of the, the water to, tower. Yeah. Right? You can see the water tower from the freeway, so you mm. could find your way here without too much trouble. Yeah. This is really cool. And there's, you know, for being small, there is a lot of visual uh, things to look at here. And we'll, we'll yeah, we had, we had a good time uh, <laughs> with the setting this place up. And uh, I tried to use a little bit of imagination on, you know, for instance, our card shark cheater mm -hmm. uh, and, our, and our other fellow looks like a real hayseed that he's getting taken advantage of. And uh, uh, my favorite is Mr. Rat, who's eating their lunch. <laughs> Well, very cool, and so we're also, I think you're gonna introduce us 
to somebody who can tell us about the coffee cup, right? Indeed, I have a very special person for you. Okay, great. So who are we gonna come meet? Well, we've got our city manager, Alex Henderson oh. is here. He knows oh, more Alex. about King hey. than Nice anybody. to meet you. Nice I'm Greg. Oh, I appreciate that. And Dave, thank you for showing us the jail. You're very welcome. And appreciate the thank introduction you for coming. to Alex. Thank you. So Alex, you've got a coffee cup here on your water tower. Yeah. Uh, how, how did this come about? This is kind of interesting. Yeah, so uh, the, the water tower, or the coffee pot as, as we call it, uh, Built in, started in 1911, finished in 1912, part of the actual uh, city's municipal water system. And so uh, at that time, it was a functioning water tower like you see all over the country. Um, and so uh, ours is a little bit interesting when it was first built, as you can see on the left-hand side here, it's just sort of more of a, a generic water tower. And mm -hmm. then in, in 1985, uh, the Chamber of Commerce here actually took, a, took on a project to uh, mold it into what it is today, which is our, uh, our Swedish uh, coffee pot. And so the structure itself holds about 60,000 uh, gallons of water. It doesn't, mm -hmm. it's, it's not holding water anymore, but uh, they've equated that to, I think, a little over a million cups of Swedish coffee. It uh, stands as a, a landmark uh, to, to the community and to our Swedish heritage. And so um, it's one of the things that uh, we're, we're pretty well known for. Well, you sure can't miss it from the freeway. I mean, yeah. it's Highway 99, it's yeah. you know, a few blocks that way, but we can still see it. So how? How tall is it? So it's about 122 feet. Uh, structure itself is uh, the actual pot is about 22 feet high and then about 19 feet in diameter. Uh, as I mentioned, holds about 60,000 gallons of water, which Ooh. is about 240 tons. Now, I know this nice sign you have here, and I noticed a few other yeah. says we're walking around. So, so is there like a walking tour? The city actually has a program we call it our micro grant program, where we'll, it's a public private partnership where we'll uh, partner with, with groups in town that want to do beautification projects. Thankfully, a pretty good relationship with our historical society. And, uh, so we uh, have been uh, working on a project with them where there's about 22 of these pedestals kind of uh, mostly in our downtown, but uh, you know, so we've got some historical homes and too, mm -hmm. and, and uh, they're, in, they're in publicly accessible places and there are uh, photos that show sort of what it used to look like and then you can look up and see what it looks like today. Mm -hmm. And it tells, uh, certainly tells the story, some history of Kingsburg. So it's just one of the newer amenities that we have. You know, we're tr always trying to add things you know, for people to come to our downtown. We're, we're lucky that it's safe and clean sure. and really walkable. Now David mentioned to me, we may have to make another trip. Sure. Uh, you've got a historic park, mm -hmm. a historic depot. Yes. It seems like there's a lot to see for a, a town of this size. Yeah, you know, it's, it's I, I guess, really a, a tribute to the, the, the residents and the community here that, that really have wanted to invest in a lot of these projects, right? And so obviously these things happen over time, but it's kind of nice to sit here and talk about the historic jail and the depot that it was just refurbished, you know, within the last five years and the historical park, which is beautiful and has all these great amenities and, and they're doing a good job of opening that up to the public and, and offering rentals and things as well and, and, and now the walking tour. So it's just kind of add a little bit every year, you know, it snowballs and mm -hmm. um, it really gives a lot of offerings so that hopefully you'll come once maybe for you know lunch or dinner or something and you'll see some of that and then you'll, you'll realize you need to come back. Yeah. Well, Alex, I appreciate your time. Yeah. We'll probably go take a look at a few more of these signs around the city. Great. And uh, you know, we'll look forward to coming back. Appreciate, appreciate it. it. Yeah, no Thank worries. You. Our final stop today is the Kearney Mansion and it's just 117 miles from Bakersfield, 93 miles from Modesto and nine miles from downtown Fresno. And we're here to see Amanda Welsh who will be our host today at the Kearney Mansion. Hello. I'm Greg. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Welcome to Kearney Mansion. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I'm really looking forward to it. It's a very interesting and cool looking building. It is a very interesting, cool looking well, building. It looks like it's really got a lot of history here. So. It does. It's 117 years of history here. 117. Wow. That, that's great. So can you give us a little background on, on the building itself? Yes. So um, the building was uh, commissioned by M. Theo Kearney. It was uh, intended to be the superintendent's lodge. Sign me up. I'll be the superintendent. Just, I know. It's quite, quite the living here for the superintendent. Sure it is. So what was, uh, what was Kearney's background? What, what um, afforded him to be able to build something like this? Well, when he came to California, he was a land promoter and he came down to the Central Valley and bought up tons of acreage out here and developed it into the colony farm system. How many acreages was his estate? The estate out here was over 6,800 acres. Wow, that's pretty yeah. big. Yeah. And great, grow grapes for the intent of being raisins? Yes, it? yes. He discovered that the Central Valley had the perfect climate for for raisin growing. Interesting. Of the 117-year-old house, about 70% of it is still original. 
So you mentioned the historic society. Um, who owns the house now? Who runs the house? What, what's kind of the background right there? Well, the house is actually owned by the UC system, the University of California. But uh, the Fresno Historical Society is actually who runs it, who takes care of it, who puts on the tours. Now this, this clock has got my attention. Is that original? This is original to the house. Mr. Kearney actually purchased this. It was purchased at a department store in San Francisco called Gumps. Gumps? Yes. Oh. So a lot of people have heard of it. A lot of people think I might be talking about shrimp. <laughs> yeah, well, okay. Yeah. yeah, nice little arched. This is my favorite archway. Um, pretty much anywhere because it's actually the last bit of remaining original ceiling that we have. Oh, wow. So it's a pressed tin anaglypta ceiling covered in plaster. So now we are going to go into the estate office. So this room is actually where all the business really happened here in the Fruitvale estate. Okay. So the main entrance that you came in, that's the private entrance for the superintendent, Mr. Kearney, and any of their guests. But this room here is actually where all the business happened where uh, workers can come in, ask any questions, get their pay, okay. things like that. And they actually came in this back entrance right here. This so one of my favorite thing. things in this room is actually this trunk right here. So mm. when Mr. Kearney uh, first arrived in America, he was 12 years old and he moved to the Boston oh, area. A young guy. Yeah. He was a young guy, yes. His family moved out here when he was pretty young. And in Boston is where he went to school and he got a degree in business advertising. And his first job right out of college was as a trunk salesman. And so, he worked for a certain company, but by the time he was 26 and he moved out here to California, he was actually a partial owner in that trunk company. Interesting. So this is one of the original trunks that Mr. Kearney brought out here to California with him, hence the K on it. And then another one I love to quiz people with is mm -hmm. what is this contraption we have right over here? You know, it, it's funny you say that because I was looking at it and I've seen those. Well, I can tell you it was made in Philadelphia. I can tell you that much too, yes. I can tell you a little bit more about it. Yeah, go ahead, because I'm drawing a blank. So this is actually an industrial-sized coffee grinder. No way. Yeah, so out here on the Fruitvale <laughs> Estate, during regular times, there were 75 full-time employees out here. But during the peak seasons, which is planting and harvesting times, mm. there were upwards of 500 people out here. Mm. And I don't know about other people, but I know I can't get anything <laughs> done in the morning until I've had my first cup of coffee. It <laughs> used to actually be in the kitchen, but this is a much better place to show it off at because this is the office. This is where yeah. we talk about the people who, who used to work here. And then we also have on display a bit more of the history of the people who were out here. And this is technically Mr. Kearney's office. Okay. So it's still largely decorated how Mr. Kearney decorated it himself okay. when he first uh, moved in here. Okay. And so most of the um, artwork that you see in a lot of the pictures were Mr. Kearney's and then mm. We actually have on display in, in almost all of the rooms black and white photos that show what it looked like oh, wow. in 1903 when the house opened. And that's how we got our references to mm. make sure it still looks the same. And lots of people like to play with these and kind of do a where's Waldo of <laughs> what's different and what's Where, the yeah, same. Where's, yeah, I noticed right behind you a framed, <laughs> a framed will, picture of our made. bricks. Well, yeah. it, it is not a picture. It is the <laughs> actual bricks. It's 28 inch thick Adobe brick that Ooh. was made here on site. Again, it helps to keep the house cool in the summer and mm -hmm. a little warmer in the winter. And that's what actually create makes <laughs> the reason why we, our windows are so, sure. so wide there. But yeah, that brick was made here on site. So in here, we also showcase a lot of Mr. Kearney's personality. We also showcase his uh, grand vision for himself which is Chateau Fresno. This was what he wanted. He wanted. Wow, this was that his dream. And it was going to be here in the park too, only mm -hmm. about a quarter of a mile that way. And what happened to those plans? Um, fortunately, Mr. Kearney passed away before it could really begin construction. Mm -hmm. One part of it did get constructed. If you notice that raised foundation that it's on, mm -hmm. all that raised, that part did get started and it's still here in the park. It's now a picnic area oh. uh, called the Oak Knoll Picnic Area. And there's a lot of picnic benches up there. And is that Mr. Kearney? And this is Mr. Kearney right here. That photo was taken in 1902. Very so distinguished uh, he was photo. He was a very distinguished gentleman. Mm -hmm. And how old was he when he passed? He was only 64. He, he was up in San Francisco, and if we know anything about San Francisco, particularly in 1906, earthquake happened. Yes. Mr. Kearney happened to be there when that happened, and mm -hmm. it woke him up, obviously. And so he tells his driver, take me back down to Fresno. I need to plan my European vacation a little earlier this year. So he comes back home to Fresno, talks to his doctor, and his doctor's like, you probably shouldn't, you know, do overseas travel. You have a heart condition. Mm -hmm. Well, Mr. Kearney was a stubborn old goat and still got on that boat. And about halfway across the Atlantic, had a heart attack in his sleep and passed away. Oh. So across the way, this is where any of the entertaining would happen when Mr. Kearney was nice. here. This, this room and our next room over are going to be where he really did his... Uh, 
his fundraising for and philanthropic adventures happened in here. So this is the reception room. I like to call it the show off room <laughs> because any guest here of either the superintendent or Mr. Kearney, this is the room that they're going to want to show off in because this is where they're going to come into first. So a lot of the pieces that we actually still have in this room were intended to go into Mr. Kearney's chateau. Oh, wow. So but I, since it never got built, some of the pieces in here are donated pieces to the historical society that we okay. felt were ashamed to keep hidden in our archives and we yeah. needed to showcase them, including this table right here in the middle. So okay. now we'll take you upstairs to the bedrooms of Kearney Mansion. As we go up the stairs, please hold on to the handrail. <laughs> this is the one time you get to touch something. All right, so now we will finish our way up to our second floor landing. So all of the wallpaper in this house was commissioned by Mr. Kearney um, in France. Oh. And then of course, one other piece of technology that Mr. Kearney had here that a lot of people did not have in 1903 is of course our telephone. Oh. Now, as I said, this house is built in the typical fashion of a four by four, where the two smaller bedrooms for children and then a ladies and a gentleman's bedroom. And this one here is the ladies bedroom. But as I said, Mr. Kearney never had a wife and no, uh, only one woman did live here. Her name was Dagmar Frizzell, and she was the wife of the second superintendent. And we do have on display a little bit of history of Dagmar because she's just an interesting of a character as Mr. Kearney was. Mm. And then if you see in these pictures, she's quite the gl glamorous woman. So not only was she an artist, she was also an actress, um, even was in a movie. Really? And um, as well as a dancer and a sportswoman. So she raised and trained horses to play polo. She was a swimmer. She was a golfer and an avid sharpshooter. Um, all the furniture on this this side is original to the room. The only thing not original is actually this trunk, which is another one of our Chinese um, historical pieces. Wow. And it's just another photograph of... Um, this is what the room looked like in 1903. Look at that. Wow. So you'll see a lot of the, the furniture is mm -hmm. still largely the same. Mm -hmm. And so this is the bedroom that we call Mr. Kearney's bedroom. And that's because this is the room where he would sleep when he was out here visiting. First superintendent, Ralph, would kick him himself out. Okay. And he had three other bedrooms to choose from when Mr. Kearney was still alive. Mm -hmm. But the rest of the time, this was going to be Mr. Uh, Frizzell, the first one, uh, Ralph's bedroom. Yeah, so this room actually used to be a lot more ornately decorated as well. So all these green rectangles you see in Mr. Kearney's well, time the had here, these right? framed photographs hanging mm -hmm. on all of them. And then we, of course, also have our pictures here of Mr. Kearney. So over the, the years. Over versus, his years versus. out here in California. So we start off in that first one when he moved here when he was in his late 20s. And then in his early 30s, they were only taken a few years apart. But then every one after that is about 10 years, his 40s, which I like to call his midlife crisis. <laughs> because no gentleman looks good with that middle part. Then his 50s and finally his <laughs> 60s here. Any, any uh, indication of why he stayed single? Well, um, we have read in his journals, and Mr. Kearney kept um, some nice journals throughout his life, um, detailing day-to-day you know, -day things and his business dealings and stuff. And up until the age of 26, he would write about a woman named Izzy. And he would write about her, and then at the age of 26, he just stopped writing about her. And then in the margins of one of those journals a little later on, it said, never fall in love. What this building behind? right here is our servants' quarters, and it's actually the oldest building on site. It was here in at least in 1892, if so not before. So this started so they could kind of prepare and work. So prepare and start. Everything here, so right? all the cooking went on in there, and there were some bedrooms, of course, for the servants and anybody else who was living out here. So the food for the people who were working out here, all of the employees of the Fruitvale Estate. There's a third or a, a basement level to our uh, servants' quarters that served as like a mess hall. Amanda. Thank you very much. This has been really interesting. I'm glad we came out here. Uh, and I'm hoping folks come out and see it. This is I am very too. interesting. I, I, the more people we get out here, the better. We love to tell the history of Fresno's early, early years and really get a lot of people don't come to their own backyard thing, but we do get a lot of locals <laughs> still. But yeah. we, we hope for more. Well, your passion, you know, of history and, and preserving the mansion really comes through. And, and I'm, I'm glad you have that energy for this. And it, 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 it's, it's really, really fun. So, again, let's remind everybody what your operation hours are and the admission fee and, and such. Yeah, so, Kearney Mansion uh, Museum is open on Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays with tours at 1, 2, and 3. Uh, adults are $6. Seniors and students are 5 and children are $4. Okay. Well, thank you again. Thank you Thank very you for much. coming out it. here and exploring. I love showing this place off. It's a, a little bit of history that a lot of people don't often see in yeah. Fresno. No matter how you choose to farm, it needs to be scientifically based, good practices, responsible practices, and the end goal being to make sure you support yourself and your family, but also help feed the world and do better for your environment.
fact, at one point they managed to turn the town into a dry town oh. uh, where there was no alcohol, which caused no end of disturbances. <laughs> <laughs>